In this video, I'm going to talk about symbiosis, which is another category of organism interaction within an ecosystem. Starting with a bit of review, remember in an ecosystem you will have a community that will consist of all the populations of all the different species there present in the ecosystem. And those populations of those different species, or sometimes even within the same species, can interact in three different ways. We can have predation, where one species actually consumes, eats the other as their energy source. There's competition, where two species or individuals within a species compete for the same resource. That resource could be food, it could be water, it could be space, it could be nesting ground. And then the third category that is going to be talked about in this video is symbiosis. And this is when two species interact in a way that's going to benefit at least one of the species. We have three different types of symbiosis, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. In mutualism, as you probably can guess from the name, both species benefit from the relationship. And you're probably familiar with some mutualistic relationships already. Plants that use insects to pollinate, such as bees, tend to be in a mutualistic relationship. The plant benefits because it is pollinated, and plants often need to be pollinated by some other plant. It can't self-pollinate. A few will self-pollinate, but many will not. So they need pollen from another plant. And the bees or the other insects collect the pollen. And bees in particular collect pollen to take it home as a protein source. So they are going to actually eat the pollen, but they don't Every little bit of pollen they collect doesn't go home to the bee. Some of it just gets transferred from one plant to another, from one flower to another. So both the plants and the bees will benefit from this relationship. And then if you've seen Finding Nemo, you know that clownfish and sea anemones have a mutualistic relationship. In this case, the clownfish is protected by living within the stinging tentacles of the sea anemone, and as it lives there, it provides a benefit to the sea anemone because it's attracting other fish that unwarily come too close to the sea anemone. Perhaps they think it is a safe place to be because they see the clownfish, but then the anemone gets something else to eat. Because anemones are carnivores, those tentacles are stinging like jellyfish, and so they will want to capture prey to eat it. Some species simply cannot survive without a mutualistic relationship. Ruminant animals, such as the goats I have at my house, or sheep, cows, deer, they depend on bacteria in the digestive system, really depend on it, because they, they, they themselves, their digestive systems without this extra bacteria are not able to digest the cellulose in the plants that they are eating. Like us, they themselves cannot digest it, but the bacteria that live in their digestive system can digest that cellulose and thereby unlock the energy and the nutrients in the plants. In order for that to happen, you have a large chamber as part of the digestive system in these ruminant animals. It is called the rumen, and it is just one of four spaces that are part of kind of the pre absorption part, the digestion, the breaking apart of the molecules that has to happen, and it takes up the largest space. And many ruminant animals have very big bellies. If you look at this picture of a goat, people will think, oh, this goat is fat, or maybe this goat is pregnant because it is so round. But it is so rounded because you have this very large, well-functioning rumen in the middle where you have lots and lots of bacteria busily digesting the food. The second category of symbiosis is commensalism. And in this category, one species benefits from the relationship, but the other species is not particularly affected or harmed. In fact, it may not even notice that it is in a relationship. For example, many whales carry barnacles on their back, and you can see sort of these bumps on this whale. It's not part of the whale. It is a barnacle, which is a little sea creature that builds a solid house around the outside that it, that it lives in, and then it is a filter feeder. It has tentacles similar to coral to collect the um, its prey from the water. And so by the barnacle living on the whale, it's going to get transported to various food sources, hopefully richer than what it would experience if it just stayed in one spot, and that allows the barnacle to survive. But the whale is not particularly affected. It may get irritated if it has too many barnacles on it, but it doesn't really get affected by carrying them. 
And then we have a relationship between birds and grazing animals. Birds will follow grazing animals, some of them are very species specific, to eat the insects that are stirred up by that animal sticking their nose and tongue in the ground. So we have a cattle egret over here, uh, you know, right beside a particular piece of a particular cattle looking for insects that are flying up because they've been disturbed by that big moist tongue ripping up a piece of grass. Many of the commensalism relationships involve one species using another for either protection or travel. So any of the animals that nest in trees, like the squirrel over here hunting an open hole in a tree, or a spider that builds a web between two plants, those are examples of commensalism for protection for a living space for that other animal. And then, of course, there's many species of plants that their seeds hitchhike because of some kind of burr or stickiness to the outside of the seed coat. They hitchhike on animals to be transported around to be deposited in another piece of soil far away from the parent plant so that seedling has a chance to grow. This is an example of burdock, which is not something that I see very much around here, but it's certainly something I grew up with in the Northeast. And I believe that the hooks on the ends of these seed pods were the inspiration for Velcro. The last category of symbiosis is parasitism. And in this case, one species benefits, but the other is harmed. For example, mosquitoes and, fee and fleas will feed on the blood of other animals. And the animal is harmed, but it's not severely harmed in this case. The the mosquitoes and fleas are getting great benefit from the nutrition of the blood. The animal will experience the annoyance of having those bites. A little bit more harmful situation is where you have a tapeworm that lives within an animal's digestive system. Tapeworms do not have their own digestive system. They need their food pre-digested, and so they're stealing the nutrients from what other animal they're, they're living in, and therefore that animal is going to lose vigor. It's not going to be as healthy, as strong. If it has too large of a tapeworm or too many tapeworms, it can be really quite severely ill. But in general, the animal will not die at least initially, from the worm infestation. But some forms of parasitism do go so far as to kill the host organism. For example, there are parasitic wasps that use caterpillars as a food source for the wasp larva. The wasp will lay the eggs inside the caterpillar. The, those eggs will hatch, and the wasp larva will basically eat the caterpillar from the inside out, and then they will break out of the caterp caterpillar to spin their own cocoons because they, being an insect, the parasitic wasp goes through that metamorphic process where you have a larva that then has a cocoon before it develops into the adult. So if you've ever seen a caterpillar with these kind of white um, capsules on it, it is probably on its last legs, if not already dead, it's providing the nutrition for that parasitic wasp. Another very strange example is the zombie ant fungus. So here we have a fungus which their spores invade an ant body and changes the ant's behavior so that it is going to move away from the rest of the ant colony, climb up a stick, and hang on the underside and actually bites the uh, piece of plant with its mandibles and then dies in that position, the fungus will grow out of the ant's body and then lay its spores down on falling down on hopefully more ants to infect. So in this case, the fungus actually changes the ant's behavior because ants would not leave the colony and go hang out halfway up a tree branch somewhere. And it uses that ant as a food source for reproduction. So all of these organism interactions will affect the sustainability of the ecosystem, how well the many organisms that are part of that community thrive. The predator-prey relationship typically keeps population numbers in check, and it will select for fit or healthy species because the weaker, sicker members of the species are going to be killed and eaten by the predators, leaving the healthier ones behind. Competition can drive genetic diversity by allowing, through natural processes, for a particular adaptation to be selected, and then you have species that will be, have specialization that eat at a certain time of day or only eat certain foods because their body structures have changed, like we looked at um, different bird beaks and how that related to their food source. So competition that way can lead to specialization. 
And then symbiosis can create these interdependent relationships where you have one organism really dependent on another one for its long-term survival. In fact, kind of the end statement is that the biodiversity that we see in the many ecosystems of our Earth, the many different species that are part of a community, really depend on these organisms' interactions. That animals are very interdependent, animals and plants, the biotic factors in an ecosystem, are interdependent. They need each other to survive, and when we have that great diversity, everybody is healthier.